Okay, welcome to the second of the lectures on Kant. So last time we spent a lot of time developing Kant's answer to Hume in his uh, theory of synthetic a priori knowledge so that we could have synthetic knowledge, which yields something new, tells us some new fact, but yet which was also in some sense a priori, meaning that it was necessary and universal. And we arrived at this theory of synthetic a priori knowledge by examining the structure of our experience and trying to work backwards to what things would have to be true in order to make the kind of experience that we have possible in the first place. Now that led us to Kant's distinction between phenomena and noumena, which is what we're going to be talking about in this lecture. So the phenomenal world, as Kant uses the term, refers to the world as it appears to us. It is the world that we see, taste, touch, smell, hear, and etc. So it's just the ordinary, everyday things that you are used to calling the real world when you're awake, alert, and moving around in your environment. Uh, it's just we have to recall once again that in this tradition, starting with roughly Descartes and his argument um, that uh, uh, we could have exactly the same sensory experience, being exactly the same epistemic position, and yet would there be nothing at all um, physical in the way that we think that it is, right? So the argument from dreaming and hallucination has again forced people to accept in this period the idea that there is what some scholars call the veil of perception, um, which are representations which stand between us and the objects which they're representing so that we don't ever actually come into contact with these objects in our experience, but yet infer that they exist um, as the causes of our experience. So Kant is working in that tradition. So when he says that the phenomenal world is the world as it appears to us, what he means is it's the world that uh, is representational. This is the stuff that we, when you look at a tree, when you're having your tree-like experience, um, we're, that's a phenomena. So that's just the world as it appears to you. Whereas the noumenal world is the world as it is in itself. That is to say, it's the world as it is when no one is looking at it. So this distinction between phenomena and noumena really isn't anything new with Kant. In fact, uh, it goes all the way back to Descartes, as we've already mentioned, um, the, 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 the difference between um, thinking for Descartes and the represented objects um, that are the causes. The same for uh, Locke. Uh, substance for him is something that's outside of our experience. And now Barclay denies that there would be a noumenal world at all because he denies that there's anything out there in the world uh, when we're not looking at it. And so um, what Kant is doing here is really just renaming the distinction which we have been aware of uh, in the previous lectures. So this is why he's going to end up calling his view a version of transcendental idealism. Because he accepts that the phenomenal world is the world of experience. That's the world we have access to and can know about. And yet he's not an idealist like Barclay, since he thinks that there are things which transcend our experience and that we can know about them by giving what he calls a transcendental argument, which is the kind of argument style that we've been talking about where you ask, what would the world have to be like in order for our experience to be the way that it is? So let's work through this a little bit uh, more carefully. Now, it is part of Kant's view that really the only things that we come to know about are the way the experience generated by our minds are going to appear to us and not anything about the noumenal world in and of itself. So Kant thinks that what science is doing is characterizing the way that our experiences appear to us. So as long as we can find knowledge to the realm where it's possible, inside the realm of experience, we'll be fine. Kant thinks that we, um, uh, that philosophers and, and people in general are always led into some kinds of errors when they try to talk about things outside of their experience. And these are the famous antinomies of pure reason that Kant talks about. And we won't really discuss these in, uh, 
in this series of lectures or the way that Kant thought transcendental idealism could solve them. Um, but that, of course, is a very important and interesting part of uh, Kant's philosophical views. So for now, what we just need to get a grip on is the difference between the phenomena and the noumena and the way in which Kant tells us that while we can't know anything about the noumena, uh, we can at least know that the noumena must exist. And so this is very important for him. This is why in his own mind he's not merely Berkeley because he has the noumena. And he thinks that unlike Descartes and Locke, he, Kant, can actually give an argument that the noumena have to exist. So, you know, um, uh, Descartes' argument relies on God, as we've seen in the previous lectures. So you have these experiences. How do you know that there's anything out there, uh, mind independently? Well, because God wouldn't allow you to be so deceived. Well, Kant is not happy with any kind of philosophical argument that relies on on God solving some kind of problem like this. So Kant wants to give a, a, and that's not to say he wasn't a religious person, he was a deeply religious person and does discuss God and the role that uh, Kant sees God playing in morality and practical reasoning about morality and so forth. Um, again, we won't really be discussing those part, that part of his view um, in this series of lectures, but it's not though Kant shied away from talking about religion, it's just that he saw his project as a more philosophical one, one that uh, uh, relied only on the resources of pure reason and seeing how far you could get there. So he doesn't want to invoke this kind of deus ex machina, the god from the machine that comes at the end and says, oh, I guarantee that the world is the way that it is there. And of course, um, Locke also never gave an argument that there were these mind-independent entities um, uh, which primary qualities resembled the primary qualities as represented in our conscious experience. So for so Locke just goes and boldly claims, oh, well, you know, when you look at a, re a, a red square, the redness is a secondary property. It exists only in your mind. But the square... That's a primary property, and there's some substance outside of the mind which actually possesses that property, the property of being square. And you can know that the, the, the square in reality resembles, in some sense, the squareness as represented in your experience. Uh, but he never gives any argument for that way of thinking. And then, of course, Barclay just comes along and says, yeah, well... How can some material object resemble your experience of that material object? And this doesn't even make sense. So clearly primary qualities are just as mental as secondary qualities. Now Kant wants to try to show that there's a way out of this kind of problem. Um, and he agrees with the Barclay point that, you know, we can't say that the things outside of our experience resemble in any way the things that we experience, the phenomenal world. Um, but nonetheless, we want to be able to say that they are there with some degree of confidence. So transcendental idealism then is Kant's way of trying to say how it is you can reconcile all of these problems that he thought he had seen in the history of philosophy. So let's just look at some pictures. So these here are noumena, so um, we can't really say anything about them as you'll see, so I just have them here as white indescript squares. It's already is saying too much about them, to be honest with you. Um, now, one of these noumena is actually you, the transcendental self, as Kant calls it. And the transcendental self is composed of these two elements. There's the understanding and the sensibility. And we'll talk a little bit more about these in just a second. But basically what their job is, is to generate the kind of experience that we have so that the noumena then are taking in other noumena and somehow the manifold, the sensor, sensory manifold there, uh, which is... Uh, operating on the co with the concepts of space and time and object and unity and plurality and so forth. Somehow there's an operation of the mind whereby all of that stuff is taken and put together into the very nice kinds of experiences that we have. So this is a, just sort of giving you the overview of how transcendental idealism looks from Kant's point of view or one way of thinking about it. Of course, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, if you go on to study any of these things in more detail, you'll come to realize a lot of these are contested issues and 
uh, Kant really is one of these people, and especially Kant, um, who uh, there are many, many different interpretations of his work, and these are just cartoon overviews of something that could be studied in a lot more detail. But generally, something like this is a pretty straightforward interpretation of the things that Kant says, that there is a phenomenal world, which is the world of experience, <clears throat> and it's structured in a certain way. So you can see earlier now, drawing out the implications of how we can have synthetic a priori knowledge, Kant says, look, you think about your experience, you're having this experience of that tree over there, and you can know a priori that any time you have an experience at all, let alone of a tree, that it's going to be located at some place. So the tree is experienced as being in some position relative to your point of view. And you see here how I have it is like across the street from the house and a little bit um, before it and so forth and so on. So we can kind of see uh, where the tree is from our point of view. And that requires that there be space in order for the experience to be located. But now notice that what has happened is we're not talking about the way the world really is here. So Kant thinks that space and time are mental phenomena. They are produced by the mind. Those are the pure concepts that the sensibility operates with. And that is actually where space comes from. So Kant is denying here that space exists apart from our experience. In the noumenal world, we can't say that there is space because to be located in space is a property of an experience of something and not a property of the thing that we experience. So notice also the self is located outside of experience and this is going to be Kant's way of solving um, Hume's problem. So you can already see how this is supposed to work. Hume says, I look in my conscious experience, I never find this thing called the self. And you were right, inside the little bubble there, there is nothing that we can really call the self. Of course, there are our representations of ourselves and other people and so forth. Um, so there I am in red saying hi, and there you are over there saying, hey, what's up? And of course, we do have experience or phenomenal experience of ourselves. But of course, that's not what's we mean by the self because the self is supposed to be something permanent that doesn't change through time. Um, and of course, our experiences are changing. So Hume is right that we never find anything in our experience. We never have an impression, remember Hume's terminology. Um, we never find anything in our experience which we can identify as the self. And Kant's going to solve that by saying, well, the self is the unifying principle of experience. It's the transcendental noumena which is putting all this stuff together. And we know that it's got to be there because our experience has to be ordered by something. We can tell that it's ordered. There's got to be something which is putting all that stuff together. And so the noumenal self is reached as a precondition of having experience at all. So this is just Kant's standard move here. We find the thing that we're interested in, that someone is criticized, and we show how we can transcendentally deduce that it must exist. So transcendentally deduced, we, by a transcendental deduction, Kant means we ask this question, how could this be possible at all, right? What would the world have to be like given that this is in fact true? And of course, what's true is everything inside the bubble there, as I have it represented here. So what we're asking is, given the stuff inside the bubble, how do, what else can we know? And what Kant is arguing here, basically, is that, well, we know that there must be a self because all of the things inside the bubble are put together. They're made for us, basically. Um, they're generated by something and ordered in a certain way as being located at certain places and being earlier and later and so forth. So there's got to be something which is putting all that stuff together. And that's the, the self. So... Um, that's a very interesting view that Kant has. And the same is true of, for instance, we know that uh, the fire, so if we were got too the close to the sun, we know that it would cause pain in us. In exactly the same way, um, even though we learn what causes what by encountering them, 
We know that given the way our experience is put together, we know that it's reliable and so forth, we know that this is going to be something which is necessary. But remember, all of this is just talking about stuff that's inside the bubble. So we're talking about the way which we will experience the world. And Kant is saying we can know with absolute certainty that we'll experience the world as being connected by cause and effect, um, as being ordered by a self, and all of these other things which were thought to be problematic. So, But we haven't talked about noumenal reality at all. We haven't talked about anything which is um, outside of experience. We can't know anything about that except that it's out there. And this, of course, is the reason why some philosophers find Kant to be a bit inconsistent here, uh, and there's a large debate over whether this really is an inconsistency in Kant's thinking, but there does seem to be something strange in saying that, well, look, you know, we know that the numeral world's out there, but strictly speaking, we can't know anything. But if we can't know anything, then how can we even know that it's out there, right? And so, but of course, this is the problem Kant thinks. Our language is built to talk about experiences and the way that experiences and the things we encounter in experience it's not used to talk about the noumenal world, and um, that's a problem because when it, uh, whenever we try to say something about it, of course, we're using these words which are built to describe things which are located in space, um, uh, things which happen earlier or later, things which are causes and effects and, and so forth, but yet we're trying to talk about something which is by definition none of those things. So... Kant says this is just a problem with language. We don't have any way to really express it. But yet in, we can say sort of in Locke's phrase, there is a something, I know not what, which is out, lies outside of our experience and is operating in these kinds of ways so as to produce these experiences that we in fact do have. Okay, so I've already said all this stuff, but let's go ahead and re-sum up um, these key claims that Kant is making. So the noumenal mind, the, the, the real self for Kant, has these two components, the sensibility and the understanding. And what they do is they take in raw, unorganized noumena and organize it into phenomena. So they're taking in all this raw input, which is just the world as it is unexperienced by us, and it's organizing, using certain principles, a coherent, experienced world. So Kant is saying, well, look, you know, the, the these things are like rose-colored glasses are the, the categories as used by the understanding and the sensibility. And of course, we can't ever take off our glasses and see what the world would look like. And every time we try to do that, we in effect uh, imagine seeing a table in a room by itself or something. Well, all we have done is seen the table as we would experience it. So all we can ever do is say, well, you know, it would look like this, it would be located over there, it would be this tall, it would be that far away from me. But that's already to talk about things which are phenomenal. These things are experienced. And the table as it is in itself can't have any of those properties. I mean, to think about the table um, being five feet away or being a certain height or something is already to talk about the way that I would experience it. So we can't ever talk about... Um, these noumenal objects or say anything about them. So we can't really say much about the way uh, this process operates. It's all outside of our understanding and we shouldn't waste our time trying to figure out um, ways to talk about these things which can't be talked about. So we should stick to the things that are within our grasp, which are the way that phenomena are organized and the um, uh, the universal pure categories that ex uh, our mind uses in constructing this kind of experience. So, well, Kant says you can deduce how many categories there are and what the mind is doing. So, as he's already uh, given you some example of how he deduces um, that the uh, concepts of space and time have to be uh, in used by the sensibility in generating experience. So, uh, in order for there to be experience, there has to be the space and there has to be time already. So we know that these are fundamental categories that the mind comes equipped with and not something that the world has independently of our experience. This is some space is itself built by the mind, Kant thinks. 
the understanding has 12 categories. Unity being an object, plurality being more than one object, totality being complete, reality being real, negation, limitation, substance or property, cause and effect, community, interactions between things, possibility or impossibility, existence or non-existence, and being necessary or contingent. So these are the categories that the understanding uses, right? The understanding as that rational part of uh, the mind. These are then concepts which are used in organizing the noumena and constructing the kinds of experiences that we have. So with these two categories, from the sensibility and these 12 from the understanding are experiences are organized in a certain way so but now notice again you can see what's what's going on here you can't say that the noumena are real because to say that something is real is already to talk about it as a phenomena so when you say that something is real what that means is that you can find it somewhere it's doing some work somewhere when you say that something exists that means in your experience, you will encounter it. When you say that something is a unity, an object, or that something is a substance or has a property, uh, then um, you're already talking about the things that we can experience. So Kant is here going to deny the way that Locke would use the word substance to talk about a noumena, right? So Locke says, well, substance is this thing which is outside of our experience, but in which these pri primary qualities are instantiated. And Kant's going to say, no, substance is something that's in our experience. Substance is a thing that we can touch, feel, manipulate. Um, and so that all of these things, all of these categories, really are phenomenal and don't apply at all to noumenal objects. You can't say of a noumena that it's one thing or many things. You can't say that it's real. You can't say that it causes anything or stands in relationships to other things or it has properties or is a substance. You can't say that it's necessary that they exist or that they don't exist. None of these kinds of concepts apply to the noumena. And Kant sees a lot of confusion in the way that previous philosophers have talked uh, when they try to talk about things outside of their experiences. Plato's theory of the forms, for instance, has the forms as substances, as real things, but they're outside of experience in this kind of important way. And Kant thinks, well, you see, you've led yourself into a kind of confusion here. Um, uh, it's true that there are things, that there's something outside of our experience, but we can't say anything definitive about it, like that it's blue or that it's one as opposed to many. So this is the difficulty that some people find in, in Kant's version of transcendental idealism is as soon as you uh, start really wondering about the noumenal world and what role it's playing, uh, Kant says, well, we can't talk that way. We can't ask those questions. So you can't say that the noumena cause your experience. So I'm having this experience of a tree right here. And I can't say that the, uh, the object itself as, as existing as I uh, unperceived by me is the thing which is causing my experience of this green leafy area uh, in my visual field because to say that something is a cause or an effect is already to locate it in the phenomenal world. So this is the big price that Kant is now paying. Um, so we know a lot about our experience. We can tell how things are. So with the cause and effect thing, as we've already said, um, the same cause must bring around the same effect, because, and we can tell that because otherwise our experience couldn't possibly be the way that it is. Uh, it wouldn't be the case that we have this very structured, regular experience. We'd have more dreamlike experience. Um, so, But again, the, the cost here is heavy because we're not talking about the noumenal world. We're talking about our experience of the world. And when we talk about atoms and quarks and electrons and quantum wave collapses and so forth, Kant says, well, look, all you're describing is the way we experience the world. Well, you're describing um, these complex relational properties, which are all true of things as we experience them, which, but don't capture anything 
about the way things are independent of our experience so that these categories um, of substance and object and all of the things which we think are real, they are real because they're in our experience and that's the way they're generated and the way we must experience the world, but they're not mind independent in this kind of sense that when there are no minds, these things aren't there. So we can't say of the noumena world that there's space or time, electrical charge, mass, or any of the things that we talk about when we do physics and science and so forth, uh, but only that there is something, some kind of something out there, which is uh, the world, the, the way that things really, really, really are. Um, now, of course, Kant would object, no, the way things really, really are is the way they appear in experience, so that he thinks that the Barclays kind of idealism is really easily refuted because what do you mean are there objects outside of my own mind? Of course there are. There's a table over there. The table is outside of my own mind, and it's a real table, and it's a mind-independent object um, in cons. But of course, all that that means is that when I turn my head over there, I'll see the table. If I leave the room and come back in, the table will be in the same position uh, it was before, but occupying a different area relative to me and etc. So that this whole debate is reinterpreted as a debate about the phenomenal world. But, and Kant thinks, well, you know, our experiences, so the, the one kind of argument he does try to give to establish that the noumena are there are one, the argument from the noumenal self being required to order and uh, uh, construct the kind of experience we have. And then the other one's a kind of interesting argument where he says, look, our, our experiences are ordered in time as before, after, later than, earlier than. And in order to order them in time, there's got to be something which isn't moving by which we can compare it because, as we know, all motion is relative. So that's a kind of interesting idea. There's got to be something standing still in order for it to even make sense that this is earlier or that's later or this comes before and that comes after. And the things which are permanent um, can't be found in experience because in experience things are rapidly always in flux. So there must be something outside of experience which is permanent by which we're able somehow to measure this kind of change. And that's an interesting kind of argument that Kant gives. Um, uh, but nonetheless, Science doesn't study this mind-independent world, this noumenal world. What science studies is the phenomenal world, and we should just learn to live with that. Now, of course, there is another interesting problem for Kant's kind of view, which some people have pointed out along the way, and that is that it really can seem like Kant is what's called a solipsist, a solipsist is someone who thinks that they are the only person that exists. And you can see why, um, I mean, Kant never says this, of course, but later people, when they're reading his stuff, come to wonder. <clears throat> they come to wonder, well, why isn't he one? So just quickly, we'll end on this. Um, so here's the kind of picture we had before. There's the noumenal you, the transcendental self, and then there's the phenomenal world up there, and Kant says, well, that's all very nice, and we can deduce that there must be a self because what else would be ordering this, and we can deduce that the noumena um, is there because our experiences are ordered in time and there has to be something stable there. We can't know anything about it. We can't, say, use any of our concepts to describe it, but nonetheless, there's got to be something out there in some sense. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I have my phenomenal experience here of, you know, seeing other people. But then, of course, that's the problem is all of you, every person I encounter in my day to day life are phenomenal. Right. I have an experience of you. You have an experience of my voice. I see you. I smell you. Hopefully not in the bad way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I can't ever know that there's a noumenal self there and. Of course, the same is happening from your point of view, right? You're a noumenal self experiencing the world. And yet somehow um, we are communicating with each other. We think at least. 
And so some people have wondered, well, how do you make sense of this, right? Each person is locked in their own phenomenal world, it would seem. And how do we know that the other people that are in our phenomenal experience really are representative of other noumenal selves, other transcendental entities, as opposed to, you know, the kind of non-player characters that you find in your standard video game. Um, they're there, they're doing things, but in some sense they're all fictional and developed by the, um, by the, the, the thing which is generating the images, in this case, the game. So, uh, now Kant says, talks in some ways as though he is a solipsist, and people who read the critique have commented on this, and I don't mean to solve it here, but merely to um, uh, raise it up for something that's interesting about Kant's view, is there, there, it, this, it is a solution to Hume's problem, right? If you adopt Kant's way of looking at stuff, you do get a solution, because you can say that even though we don't have experiences or there's nothing phenomenal uh, which we can trace these concepts back to, we can still say that they're meaningful because they tell us the way our experiences are structured so that we can still know a priori that these kinds of things will be true and that the self exists and that cause and effect must be necessary and so forth. Um, but it comes at the very high cost of uh, accepting transcendental idealism, accepting the idea that all we ever do, or all we ever can do, all we ever should do, is talk about experience, particular experiences which follow each other, and then the general conditions under which experience is possible. And some people have thought, well, <clears throat> if that's the cure, then the cure is worse than the disease. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are people who defend Kant's view, and there are people who defend him as not even holding some kind of uh, two worlds view like we've been talking about here. But so, as I've said, the understanding Kant is a difficult task, and there is a lot that one could say about it. In general, though, let's just sum up what we've been saying with words, put this all together. Kant tells us that he thinks that this is, uh, and these are his own words, he thinks that this is a Copernican revolution in philosophy. So, remember Copernicus. Copernicus reversed the position of the sun and the earth. It was thought for a long time that the earth was at the center and the sun, um, uh, where the earth was stationary and the sun revolved around it. And, of course, in the Copernican scheme, it's the opposite. The earth is not stationary. It's in orbit around the sun and the sun is at the center, stationary. Now, of course, as we've already talked about, both those views are wrong. Neither of these things are an absolute rest, but um, um, it is more correct to say that the sun is at the center of our solar system and the earth is in motion around it. So Kant sees himself as doing something like what Copernicus did. It used to be that the, the world was out there and the mind acted kind of like a passive recorder of an outside reality so that it was just kind of accepting these inputs passively um, and sort of faithfully mirroring or uh, resembling the stuff that was outside of it. Whereas Kant sees it the other way around. The human mind is constructing reality. Reality is something that's mental. Reality in its totality is a mental construct produced by the mind behind the scenes working according mm -hmm. to certain universal laws. And of course, this is the way that he sees the coming together of rationalism and empiricism. Um, he, he's an empiricist in the sense that he thinks that science is a synthetic activity, that science generates new knowledge, and without doing the science, we can't tell what's going to follow from what. But at the same time, he endorses a priori rationalist knowledge because we can know um, certain general facts about features of our experience which don't come from any particular experiences. So they have to be based just purely on um, reasoning about what would make the kinds of experiences that we have possible.
And so Kant thinks that one of the greatest arguments for transcendental idealism is that it solves so many of the problems which his predecessors has. So it solves Hume's problem. We can say we know there's a self. We can say we know there's a mind-independent world. We can say we know that cause and effect is necessary. It, it solves problems about... Um, free will and determinism. So Kant is happy to say, well, look, in the phenomenal world, everything is determined by cause and effect. But in the noumenal world, there is no cause and effect because there, and so there is no determination by cause and effect because it's not, those concepts don't even apply out there. So we can have libertarian freedom. We can be completely free, free in a sense of being uncaused, even though everything we experience in the phenomenal world is itself a product of causes and effects. So you get a kind of um, reconciliation there. Now, of course, how it is that uh, free acts of in the noumenal world give rise to anything in the phenomenal world is, of course, another very deep question um, because it's not going to be by any way of knowing about cause and effects uh, in the way that we know about them since those things don't operate in the noumenal world. Okay, well, that draws us to a, a conclusion of this lecture on Kant. And, of course, there's much more that we could say, but we're just going to have to leave it there for now.